Chapter Fourteen of Eight Thirteen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eight Thirteen by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter Fourteen: The Man in Black. At that moment, Arsène Lupin felt the impression, the certainty, that he had been drawn into an ambush by means which he had not the time to perceive, but of which he guessed the prodigious skill and address. Everything had been calculated, everything ordained, the dismissal of his men, the disappearance or treachery of the servants, his own presence in Mrs. Kesselbach's house. Clearly the whole thing had succeeded, exactly as the enemy wished, thanks to circumstances almost miraculously fortunate. For, after all, he might have arrived before the false message had sent his friends away. But then there would have been a battle between his own gang and the Altenheim gang. And Dupin, remembering Malreich's conduct, the murder of Altenheim, the poisoning of the mad girl at Veldenz, Lupin asked himself whether the ambush was aimed at him alone, or whether Malreich had not contemplated the possibility of a general scuffle, involving the killing of accomplices who had by this time become irksome to him. It was an intuition, rather, a fleeting idea that just passed through his mind. The hour was one for action. He must defend Dolores, the abduction of whom was, in all likelihood, the first and foremost reason of the attack. He half opened the casement window on the street and levelled his revolver. A shot rousing and alarming the neighbourhood, and the scoundrels would take to their heels. "'Well, no,' he muttered. "'No, it shall not be said that I shirked the fight. The opportunity is too good. And then who says that they would run away? There are too many of them to care about the neighbours.' He returned to Dolores's room. There was a noise downstairs. He listened, and finding that it came from the staircase, he locked the door. Dolores was crying and throwing herself about the sofa. He implored her, "'Are you strong enough? We are on the first floor. I could help you down. We can lower the sheets from the window.' "'No, no, don't leave me. I am frightened. I haven't the strength. They will kill me. Oh, protect me!' He took her in his arms and carried her to the next room, and bending over her, "'Don't move, and keep calm. I swear to you that not one of those men shall touch you as long as I am alive.' The door of the first room was tried. Dolores, clinging to him with all her might, cried, "'Oh, there they are! There they are! They will kill you! You are alone!' Eagerly he said, "'No, I am not alone. You are here. You are here beside me.' He tried to release himself. She took his head in her two hands, looked him deep in the eyes, and whispered, "'Where are you going? What are you going to do? No, you must not die. I won't have it. You must live. You must.' She stammered words which he did not catch, and which she seemed to stifle between her lips, lest he should hear them. And having spent all her energy, exhausted, she fell back unconscious. He leaned over her and gazed at her for a moment. Softly, lightly, he pressed a kiss upon her hair. Then he went back to the first room, carefully closed the door between the two, and switched on the electric light. "'One second, my lads,' he cried. "'You seem in a great hurry to get yourself smashed to pieces. Don't you know that Lupin's here? I'll make you dance.' While speaking, he unfolded a screen in such a way as to hide the sofa on which Mrs. Kesselbach had been lying, and he now spread dresses and coverings over it. The door was on the point of giving way under the blows of the men outside. Here I am. Coming. Are you ready? Now, gentlemen, one at a time. He briskly turned the key and drew the bolt. Shouts, threats, a roar of infuriated animals came through the open doorway. Yet none of them dared come forward. Before rushing at Lupin, they hesitated, seized with alarm, with fear. This was what he had reckoned on. Standing in the middle of the room, full in the light, with outstretched arm, he held between his fingers a sheaf of banknotes, which he divided, counting them one by one, into seven equal shares. And he calmly said, Three thousand francs reward for each of you, if Lupin is sent to his last account. That's what you were promised, isn't it? Here's double the money. He laid the bundles on the table, within reach of the scoundrels. The broker roared, Bum, bum, he's trying to gain time. Shoot him down. He raised his arm. His companions held him back. And Lupin continued, of course, this need not affect your plan of campaign. You came here first to kidnap Mrs. Kesselbach, and secondly to lay hands on her jewels. Far be it from me to interfere with your laudable intentions. Look here, what are you driving at? growled the broker, listening in spite of himself. Aha, broker, I'm beginning to interest you, am I? 
Come in, old chap. Come in, all of you. There's a draught at the top of those stairs, and such pretty fellows as you mustn't run the risk of catching cold. What, are we afraid? Why, I'm all by myself. Come, pull yourself together, my lambs. They entered the room, puzzled and suspicious. Shut the door, broker. We shall be more comfortable. Thanks, old man. Oh, by the way, I see the notes are gone. Therefore we're agreed. How easy it is for honest men to come to terms. Well, and next? Next? Well, as we're partners. Partners? Why haven't you accepted my money? We're working together, old man, and we will carry off the young woman together first, and carry off the jewels after. The broker grinned. <laughs> Don't want you for that. Yes, you do, old man. Why? Because you don't know where the jewels are hidden, and I do. We'll find out. Tomorrow, not tonight. Well, let's hear. What do you want? My share of the jewels. Why didn't you take the lot, as you know where they are? Can't get at them by myself. There's a way of doing it, but I don't know it. You're here, so I'm making use of you. The broker hesitated. Share the jewels. Share the jewels. A few bits of glass and brass, most likely. You fool! There's more than a million's worth. The men quivered under the impression made upon them. Very well, said the broker. But suppose the Kesselbach gets away. She's in the next room, isn't she? No, she's in here. Lupin, for a moment, pulled back one of the leaves of the screen, revealing the heap of dresses and bedclothes which he had laid out on the sofa. She's here, fainting, but I shan't give her up till we're divided. Still... You can take it or leave it. I don't care if I am alone. You know what I'm good for. So please yourselves. The men consulted with one another, and the broker said, Where is the hiding place you're talking of? Under the fireplace. But when you don't know the secret, you must first lift up the whole chimney piece, looking glass, marble, and all in a lump, it seems. It's no easy job. Pooh! We're a smart lot, we are. Just you wait and see. In five minutes. He gave his orders, and his pals at once set to work with admirable vigour and discipline. Two of them, standing on chairs, tried to lift the mirror. The four others attacked the fireplace itself. The broker, on his knees, kept his eyes on the hearth and gave the word of command. Cheerly, lads, all together, if you please. Look out. One, two. Ah, there, it's moving. Standing behind them, with his hands in his pockets, Lupin watched them affectionately and at the same time revelled with all his pride, as an artist and master, in this striking proof of his authority, of his might, of the incredible sway which he wielded over others. How could those scoundrels for a second accept that improbable story, and lose all sense of things, to the point of relinquishing every chance of the fight in his favour? He took from his pockets two great massive and formidable revolvers, and calmly, choosing the first two men whom he would bring down, and the two who would fall next, he aimed as he might have aimed at a pair of targets in a rifle gallery. Two shots together, and two more. Loud yells of pain, four men came tumbling down, one after the other, like dolls at a cockshy. Four from seven leaves three, said Lupin. Shall I go on? His arms remained outstretched, levelled at the broker and his two pals. You swine! growled the broker, feeling for a weapon. Hands up! cried Lupin, or I fire. That's it. Now you two, take away his toys. If not... The two scoundrels, shaking with fear, caught hold of their leader and compelled him to submit. Bind him! Bind him, confound it! What difference does it make to you? Once I'm gone, you're all free. Come along. Have you finished? The wrists first. With your belts. And the ankles. Hurry up! The broker, beaten and disabled, made no further resistance. While his pals were binding him, Lupin stooped over them and dealt them two terrific blows on the head with the butt-end of his revolver. They sank down in a heap. "'It's a good piece of work,' he said, taking breath. "'Pity there are not another fifty of them. I was just in the mood. And all so easily done, with a smile on one's face. What do you think of it, broker?' The scoundrel lay cursing. Lupin said, "'Cheer up, old man. Console yourself with the thought that you are helping in a good action.' the rescue of Mrs. Kesselbach. She will thank you in person for your gallantry. He went to the door of the second room and opened it. What's this? he said, stopping on the threshold, taken aback, dumbfounded. The room was empty. He went to the window, saw a ladder leaning against the balcony, a telescopic steel ladder, and muttered, Kidnapped! Kidnapped! Louis de Malreich! Oh, the villain! He reflected.